eosinophilic granuloma of bone. The Great Mimica, the 22nd of April 2023. The this video has been produced from an article source that has been shown below. We would like to thank the corresponding author, Andrea Angelini. Introduction Langerhan cell histiocytosis is a rare disease involving clonal proliferation of Langerhan cells. It is part of a group of clinical syndromes called histiocytoses, which are characterized by an abnormal proliferation of histiocytes, an archaic term for activated dendritic cells and macrophages. These diseases are related to other forms of abnormal proliferation of white blood cells, such as leukemias and lymphomas. The disease, previously known as histiocytosis X, was renamed in 1985 by the Histiocyte Society as Langerhan cell histiocytosis because of the proliferation of Langerhan cells. The spectrum includes localized to bone eosinophilic granuloma and the rare multisystem syndromes Han Shu diaresis ulla Christian disease and Abd Letter Siway disease. The manifestations range from isolated bone lesions to multisystem disease. Eosinophilic granuloma is a rare, benign tumor-like disorder characterized by clonal proliferation of antigen-presenting mononuclear cells of dendritic origin known as Langerhan cells. It is the most common manifestation of Langerhan cell histiocytosis, 60-80% cases, accounting for less than 1% of all bone tumors. In 80% of cases it affects children and adolescents. It can affect any bone in the skeleton. However, bone lesions are more common in the skull, mandible, spine, ribs, and long bones. The femur, humerus and clavicle are the most frequent sites. The pathogenesis is unclear. Viruses such as Epstein-Barr and human herpes virus 6, bacteria, and genetic factors have been implicated. An immunological dysfunction including an increase in certain cytokines such as interleukin-1 and interleukin-10 is affected patients have also been reported. Familial occurrence is very rare. In the spine, eosinophilic granuloma accounts for 6.5 to 25% of all spinal bone tumors. The most common location is the thoracic spine followed by the lumbar and the cervical spine. Clinical symptoms are often severe and depend on spinal location. The most common include back or neck pain, tenderness to spinal palpation and restricted range of motion, or torticollis, spinal instability and neurological symptoms. In the extremities, most lesions are diaphysile. The physical examination of the child may be essentially normal. Laboratory findings are usually nonspecific except for a moderate and inconsistent rise in erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Imaging. The typical radiographic appearance of eosinophilic granuloma of the extremities is a punched-out lytic bone lesion without reactive sclerosis. In most cases, a hypervascularized soft tissue mass surrounds the affected bone. Punched-out lesion. He radiographic differential diagnosis should include plasmacytoma, multiple myeloma, osteochondritis, tuberculosis or osteomyelitis. In the spine, imaging studies may reveal variable vertebral involvement, ranging from isolated lytic lesions to a more significant vertebral collapse that involves the pedicles and posterior vertebral elements, vertebra plana, peritoral spread and paraspinal soft tissue components. Cervical spine eosinophilic granuloma more often manifests with osteolytic lesions, rather than vertebra plana. Diagnosis tissue biopsy for histological diagnosis is necessary when clinical and radiological manifestations are ambiguous, and the lesions are symptomatic. CT guided biopsy for eosinophilic granuloma has been effective for histological diagnosis, with low morbidity and a diagnostic accuracy of 70 to 100%. Although anecdotally excellent results with biopsy alone have been previously reported for patients with eosinophilic granulomas, biopsy should not be considered as a strategy for treatment of these patients but rather as a step to confirm diagnosis. Management. Various treatment options have been reported for eosinophilic granuloma of bone, including observation and immobilization, endomethacin administration, 
methylprednisolone injections, radiofrequency ablation, local excision and curettage with or without bone grafting, chemotherapy and irradiation. Results have been reported as satisfactory with a recurrence rate of less than 20%. In general, the treatment of typical solitary lesions in asymptomatic patients is conservative. In patients with mild neurological deficits from solitary eosinophilic granulomas of the spine, immobilization and radiation therapy has been reported. Low-dose radiation therapy is advocated by some authors to be effective in the healing of lytic lesions and limiting disease progression. Others argue that radiation therapy may damage endochondral growth plates and limit bone healing and reconstitution, or lead to secondary radiation-induced morbidity such as post-radiation sarcomas and myelitis. Although no clear correlation between the degree of vertebral collapse and the degree of neurological symptoms has been observed, in patients with severe pain and restriction of range of motion, and or persistent spinal subluxation and neurological symptoms, surgical treatment is required. Chemotherapy is not recommended for solitary eosinophilic granuloma, and should be reserved for systemic involvement, or as initial therapy in children with solitary lesions in locations that preclude safe and complete surgical resection. Since eosinophilic granuloma in children is known to resolve spontaneously with time, observation alone or biopsy alone to confirm the diagnosis have also been recommended as a treatment strategy. A previous study reported spontaneous resolution without recurrence of the lesions in six skeletally immature patients that had biopsy followed by observation alone, open biopsy in three and percutaneous in three, suggesting the intriguing possibility that surgery may result in a higher rate of recurrence than less aggressive procedures. We concur that biopsy may have an effect on bone healing and eosinophilic granuloma lesions reconstitution. However, we disagree that patients, especially children with symptomatic bone lesions should be left alone to let the disease take its natural course without a histological diagnosis. Moreover, although solitary eosinophilic granuloma is considered a benign lesion, without treatment, the time required for resolution is unpredictable and can be associated with significant morbidity secondary to unremitting pain, restricted activity, growth disturbance, or pathological fracture. Therefore, we recommend that these patients should undergo biopsy for histological diagnosis, and treatment is then considered. Methylprednisolone injection. Given the benign biology and clinical course of eosinophilic granuloma and the pediatric group of patients that this condition more commonly affects, a treatment approach that carries a lower risk of complications while ensuring a successful cure is desirable. In this setting, Symptomatic lesions that are accessible in the spine or the extremities. Fig. 1A sagittal T2 weighted MRI with fat suppression of the cervical spine of a 43-year-old woman with a painful osteolytic lesion of the C7 vertebral body. B. CT guided frozen section biopsy showed eosinophilic granuloma. Intralesional methylprednisolone injection was performed. C. Sagittal T2 weighted MRI with fat suppression. D. Axial CT scan show complete reconstitution of the lesion four years after diagnosis and treatment. Therefore, we recommend that these patients should undergo biopsy for histological diagnosis, and treatment is then considered. Methylprednisolone injection. Given the benign biology and clinical course of eosinophilic granuloma and the pediatric group of patients that this condition more commonly affects, a treatment approach that carries a lower risk of complications while ensuring a successful cure is desirable. In this setting, symptomatic lesions that are accessible in the spine or the extremities or the extremities may be treated with intralesional methylprednisolone injection after tissue biopsy for histological diagnosis. Figure. 4. A anteroposterior radiograph of the pelvis of a 6-year-old boy with a painful osteolytic lesion at the left ischial ramus. CT-guided frozen section biopsy showed eosinophilic granuloma. Intralesional methylprednisolone injection was performed. B. 
Anteroposterior radiograph of the pelvis shows complete reconstitution of the lesion one year after diagnosis and treatment. Author's commentary and conclusion. This review summarizes current concepts in the diagnosis and management of patients with eosinophilic granuloma, with emphasis on the role of intralesional methylprednisolone injection for the successful cure of patients with symptomatic lesions. In the past, we planned for observation alone for patients with imaging evidence of eosinophilic granuloma and curettage for the most painful lesions. It was our initial belief that percutaneous techniques do not provide adequate tissue for definitive diagnosis for mesenchymal tumors. This belief was based on the agreement among pathologists that mesenchymal tumors are among the most difficult of pathologies to accurately diagnose. We then realized that patients, especially children with symptomatic bone lesions, should not be left alone for the disease to take its natural course without a histological diagnosis. Over the past 15 years, we have been able to refine the procedures for needle or trocar and frozen sections biopsy to assess the adequacy of the biopsy specimen. A histologic image of eosinophilic granuloma with Langerhans cells. Nowadays, we believe that histological diagnosis is necessary for all bone lesions, and recommend that biopsy should not be considered a strategy for treatment of eosinophilic granuloma but rather as a step to confirm diagnosis. By using CT-guided intralesional methylprednisolone injection, frozen sections histological diagnosis can be obtained in all patients. After biopsy, intralesional injection of methylprednisolone is considered beneficial, or at least not harmful. In our practice, tissue procurement and frozen sections biopsy are usually diagnostic in all patients with suspected eosinophilic granuloma. Figure. 1A sagittal T2 weighted MRI with fat suppression of the cervical spine of a 43-year-old woman with a painful osteolytic lesion of the C7 vertebral body. B. CT guided frozen section biopsy showed eosinophilic granuloma. Intralesional methylprednisolone injection was performed. C. Sagittal T2 weighted MRI with fat suppression. D. Axial CT scan show complete reconstitution of the lesion four years after diagnosis and treatment. Even if the definite histological diagnosis is different, intralesional methylprednisolone injection would not have resulted in any adverse effect, but rather it would have decreased intralesional edema and provided pain relief. Our long-term results support biopsy and intralesional methylprednisolone injection as a safe treatment for eosinophilic granulomas of bone with complete resolution of pain and imaging reconstitution of the lesions. Figure. 1A sagittal T2 weighted MRI with fat suppression of the cervical spine of a 43-year-old woman with a painful osteolytic lesion of the C7 vertebral body. B. CT guided frozen section biopsy showed eosinophilic granuloma. Intralesional methylprednisolone injection was performed. C. Sagittal T2 weighted MRI with fat suppression. D. Axial CT scan show complete reconstitution of the lesion four years after diagnosis and treatment. This video has been produced from an article source that has been shown below. We would like to thank the corresponding author, Andrea Angelini.